introduce our guest speaker today is Mr. Ibrahim Rueda. Okay, he's going to talk to us about Sarki van die Kaap. Now, Mr. Rueda has got a, a long history in the archives. Um, I don't know how he does it, but he's always able to find people that I can't find. So I get a bit lost between the van der Kaaps and, and I get stuck on trying to find my own slave ancestors, but he seems to just have the knack of doing it. He's published a couple of books, okay, and is well known for his talks, and I'm sure he is going to give us something very interesting today. Mr. Roda, baie dankie dat jy bereik is om met ons te praat. Ons waardeer het, dus vir ons is het een groot voorraag om jou hier te hee. Hai, baie dankie, Alta, en ek waardeer die geleentheid wat jy my gin om my kleine bieke kennis en my navolsend met jy te deel. Die, die onderwerp is Saartje van de Kaap. The, the, the name Sarki van de Kaap implies that, that she's a slave who was born here at the Cape. But before I proceed with my talk about Sarki, I would like to acknowledge the first and foremost, the GGSA, and thank them for the opportunity that I could share my little knowledge with those who are listening in this morning. Secondly, the sources that I consulted to make this, this talk possible. And among others, it would be most of the book carved by the late Dr. Ahmad Davis and his other little book, The History of the Tanabaru. In addition, I've consulted Professor Robert Sell's book, Children of Bondage, and also the book written by Jackie Lewis, Echoes of Slavery, and of course, the big one by Nigel Warden et al., The Making of a City, uh, Cape Town, The Making of a City. And then a very important source was that of J.C.L. Haasbroek, who wrote his thesis in 1955 at Stellenbosch University about the mission to the Muslims of Cape Town during both the Dutch and specifically the Dutch period. And of course, then there are some quotes from uh, Shafiq Morton, the journalist on Voice of the Cape. And of course, there's an article that appeared in the Burhanu uh, uh, publication. Uh, it's just titled Sarki van de Kaap. But I want to quote the introductory paragraph of that uh, particular article. And it states, and I quote, we live in a time when wealth it defines prestige and, and signal status. This materialism is symptoms of both the time we live in and post-apartheid generation where people were denied opportunities by virtue of their race. It is therefore even more remarkable to learn about Sarki or Sara van der Kaap, who in her lifetime went from slave to landowner and chose Islam and her community above personal gain, gain, unquote. And that appeared in this article that was published in July uh, 2020. Now, who is Sarfi? Who were Sarfi's parents? Sarchi was born in 1770 as a little slave girl. And her, my, her father was Corridon from Ceylon. Not all slaves came from Indonesia or Angola or Mozambique or Madagascar. Many slaves, in fact, some historians indicate that most of the slaves came from India, from Bengal and the Malabar coast. Now, Sarchi, his father was Corridon from Ceylon, and the mother was trained, trained from the Cap, which means that she was a slave born there at the Cape. Were Corridon and Train married? As Muslims, they would have been married. And this is according to Professor Robert Sell. And you'll find that information on page 320 of his book, Children of Bondage, that slaves could not marry in the church. But, and this is the big but, the Imams who were already present at the Cape, because of all those people who were sent by the, the VOC to the Cape, they were performing Islamic marriages of free men to slaves 
and vice versa, and even among the slaves, they were marrying people. Now that is so important because slaves were not allowed to marry in the church until ordinance 19 of 1826, which then allowed after they had been baptized that they could now marry in the church. But prior to that, our Imams throughout the Dutch and even through the British colonial period, they were marrying slaves to free men and vice versa, and even among them slaves. Now, why is it important? Because when you marry, you form a family and a family is the basis of a community. And in that way, so many Muslim communities arose in the colony during the Dutch and the British colonial period. That today we find Islamic communities all over in the Western Cape dating way back to the time of the Dutch period. So I can say conclusively that Corridon and Train, they were married. And this little girl, Saatje, was born in 1770, but they were set free. Corridon was the slave of an Afrikaner here at the Cape. And uh, sorry, Corridon was the, was the slave of a man named Sali, about whom I know very little. But Train was the slave of an Afrikaner farmer here at the Cape. But they were set free by, by him in, in 1779, which means that Sati was nine year old when she was set free. And Sali also manumitted Corridon of Ceylon. I just want to focus on Corridon. Corridon is unique in this sense that according to the late Ahmad Davids, he is the first Muslim to buy property in the Bukhaf. Now, when I refer to the Bukhaf, I'm referring to a residential area like Rose Street, Dorf Street, Wales Street, where many free blacks and Muslims were staying, which later became the Malay quarter of the Bukhaf. Corridon has the uniqueness of being the first Muslim to buy property in Dorf Street in 1794. And that is the property which will feature in the talk about Sarti van der Kaap. He died in 1797. And then his wife Train inherited the property in Dorp Street. That is where the first mosque eventually was to be erected. Now, if we look at Train, Train, according to what Ahmad Davis wrote about her, was an astute businesswoman. In addition to this property, she also owned slaves. Just remember, Muslims, like the settler farmers, also owned slaves. Like Tuanguru owned slaves, his son Abdul Rakib and, and Abdul Rauf, they also owned slaves. But I've got a document here where Rakib and Abdul Rauf indicated that when they die, those slaves should be set free. So it was not only the colonialists who owned slaves, even free blacks, even Muslims, they own slaves there at the Cape. Coming back to Sarki, Sarki then eventually uh, trained, in fact, sorry, let, let's focus on train. Train owned four slaves, and in addition, train accommodated another four slaves, three, uh, one male, uh, uh, three males and one female. In fact, she had some sort of a lodge, and that was, that was one way in which she could also generate money. So she was a real businesswoman. And the question is, where did all the slaves stay in Cape Town at the time, the period I'm referring to? Where did they stay? We know that during the Dutch colonial period, the slaves owned by the company, they were all housed in the slave lodge, which is still there today, the Ezekiel Museum at, at the top of Adderley Street. But where did the other slaves, where did they reside in the city? Many of these slaves, they would sleep in the attics of the cellars of the owners. But many of these slaves, they found lodgings with Muslims in the city. And we find there's a lot of empathy shown by the Muslims towards the slaves in this particular period. In fact, I found uh, uh, in the records of a guy called Hudson who came to the Cape 
and he gave a detailed description of what some of the Muslims did when a slave died. They would fetch his body, they would properly bomb him, prepare him for burial, and give him a proper Muslim burial. So you see, there was a lot of empathy among the Muslims for the slaves, because nowhere in the world can you say that slavery was a good thing, because some slave owners might have been good to their slaves, but the brutal way in, in which slaves were punished tells you that slavery was not a good thing at all. But in any case, trainers sells then owned the property, and in 1809, Train sold the property to her daughter, Sarchi van der Kaap. Now, what does it tell you? Sarchi paid 3,000 guilders, which in our money today is more property about 27,000 rand, which tells you that Sarchi was also an astute businesswoman. By that time, she was already married to Ahmad of Bengala, who later became the Imam of the Owan Masjid from 1822 until he died in 1843. Now, what is unique about Sarki is that she's probably the first Muslim woman in Cape Town that even though she was married to Ahmad of Bengal, that she could buy property in her own name, which is allowed according to Islamic teachings, according to the Quran. So in this sense, it makes Sarki also unique that she was the first person that could buy property while she was married to Imam Ahmad of Bengalan. If we look at Sarki, she was born in 1770. Sarki would have seen many things during her lifetime. From 1770 and 1795, she would have witnessed the demise of the Dutch East India Company. Because by then in 1795, when she was about 15 and 25 years old already, she saw the coming of the British with the first occupation. So she was so fortunate that she could live one part of her life during the Dutch colonial period and the rest of her life from 1795 onwards, even with the short break of Batavian rule, she must have seen the, the ships of the Batavian Republic coming and going for the short period from 1805 three until 1806. She saw all these things. And eventually, she saw in 1806, France from Bengalan marching with the Japanza artillery to blow their strand to help to defend the Cape against the, the takeover by the British for the second occupation. All these things were seen by the women. And then of course, throughout the Dutch period, throughout the British colonial period, he saw so many things. In fact, by 1799, Darcy must have been aware of the coming of the missionary uh, Dr. Van der Kemp. The focus is not on Van der Kemp himself, but the, the significance of the coming is, is very important because well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. he came with a letter I came with a letter from the London Missionary Society which was in 1995 by both the London and the Dutch Missionary Society. And in this letter, he came to the Cape appealing to all those doing mission work to coordinate their efforts. Because even among the missionaries here at the Cape, they were, there was a lot of bickering. Who has the right to, to baptize? Can an ordinary lay preacher baptize a slave? Or must you be an ordained minister? Even among them, they were fighting. So he came with this letter, it was first written in English, but quickly translated into Dutch. And they went around to the churches here in the colony, appealing to them, to all the, 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 the people doing mission work to coordinate their efforts. What was so important of this visit of Van der Kemp, even though he did no mission work in Cape Town, he went to Bethelsdorf. But that's another long story. But the, the significance of his coming, it led to the formation of the South African Mystery Society in 1799. Now, this was very important because four, five years later in 1804 under Batavian rule, Islam was unbanned for the first time because during the Dutch period, Islam was not allowed to be practiced or being propagated publicly. 
they were not allowed to build churches. But now 1804, Islam was unbanned and you could now practice and propagate Islam. But, and this is the big but, in the same tune, missionaries were now allowed to come into the colony and they came from all over. The oldest one being the Moravians who came as early as 1780 and settled at Kanatendal, working mostly under the Khoi people there. But then between 1804 and 1834, in that 30-year period, missionaries came from all over Europe. They came from Scotland, they came from France, they came from Ireland, and lately the messages came in 1816, very late under the leadership of Barnabas Shaw. Now, what does this mean? It means now they were they came with this message that they must bring, try to bring every heathen into the fold of Christianity. My question that I pose, when all these missionaries came, did we have enough Muslim imams and leaders to counter the missionary drive? And I would argue, yes, because during the Dutch period, and yeah, the Dutch became, the VOC became the biggest agent for Islam. Because between 1652 and 1795, they exiled more than 200 Urankayan, people of political and economic influence to the Cape. In fact, these people was, were so influential that they, they, they encouraged the slaves to desert, to run away. In fact, I found in one book by Kerry Ward, Networks of Empire, that Simon van der Sel in 1712 was appealing to the authorities in Batavia Please do not send these Muslim political leaders to the Cape because they encourage the slaves to run away. And when the slaves run away, we do not have enough soldiers in, 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 at the Cape to hunt them down. But I think the strategy of the Imam or the leaders at that time was, was, was very, very noble in this regard that they realized if you run away, there's no labor. So if there's no labor, there's no production. And if there's no production, you cannot supply the, the passing fleets on their way to the east or back to Europe. So they had the strategy to fight the colonial imperialists at the time. Coming back to the numbers, apart from these the political exiles, there were so many imams that were sent to the Cape, people who opposed Dutch imperialism in the land of birth, especially in Indonesia. And many of them were exiled to the Cape, these, these imams. And in addition, if you transgressed any of the laws of the Dutch in Indonesia, you were posted to the Cape as a convict. And you could be used here in the public works of the VOC. Now, what did it do to the demography of the colony? It brought a totally new dimension in that so many Muslims were now placed here in the colony. In fact, the Dutch then became the biggest agent for Islam by bringing so many Muslims to the Cape. And this was actually laying the table for a competition between the Christian missionaries and the Islamic leadership at the Cape. I have found enough evidence in the records, especially of the Methodist Church. I went down to Rhodes University and in their records, I found enough evidence that the Imams at the Cape both during the Dutch and the British colonial period, they were giving the missionaries a run for their money. Now, this is the, the era into which Sarchi van der Kaap was born. As early as 1786, this was during the Dutch period, there was a young minister by the name of Van Lee who lamented the fact that so many of the slaves were embracing Islam. This is 1786. 1772, you see, the, the, the sad part, or I would say the beautiful part of the Dutch policy was the, the ambiguity. They banned Islam, but yet Islam was alive in a clandestine manner. In fact, two years after Sarchi was born in 1772, there's a guy from Sweden by the name of Carl Peter Sandberg. And he gives a detailed description of Muslims 
in a room in Cape Town. There were no mosques because the first mosque only came 1794. He says in this room, they were beautifully dressed men and women. And there was a guy with a, a violin providing some music. And I think that is the reason why the Cape Malays are so fond of music too. And he says here in the room, there's a pillow on the pillow, there's a book. And he believes this book is the Quran. And he thinks that they were celebrating the new year. But after consulting the date, which was 20th of June, 1772, we went to the Hijri calendar, that is the Islamic calendar. And we find that that book was not the Quran. That book was actually a book of praises. We call it a Ruayat book, praises of the prophet that they were singing. They were celebrating the birthday of the prophet, which we are still doing here at the Cape and all over the world. When it comes to the, we call it Mawlud and Nabi, the prophet of the, uh, uh, the birthday of the prophet. So Islam was alive. Even two years after Sarti was born, Islam was alive in Cape Town. And I suspect there were many of these rooms. They call it in Indonesia, they call it a langar. It's a place used as a mosque. It is not the mosque proper. And we still have some, in fact, when we were in Indonesia in 1994, we were in Yogyakarta. So we were walking towards a mosque, but on our way, we passed the langar and we performed our prayers in this langar. It's like a prayer room. So you see, Islam was alive even at the time when Sati was two years old. So what I'm trying to tell you is Sati was born into an era where so many things were happening and she was witnessing all that. I think what is important to note is that Sati's contribution we have to look at what did she do that, that makes her so unique. First, we mentioned that she's the first woman that could buy property, right? Secondly, she married, she married an imam. Or the one, he was an imam and eventually, after Tuan Guru died, he eventually became the imam of the first mosque in Cape Town in Dorp Street, that is Imam Ahmad of Bengalan. And what is beautiful about Ahmad of Bengalan, he was also a slave. And that is was the beauty of Islam in this particular period, that Islam allowed the slave upward mobility in society. In fact, he's a slave and he became the imam of the first mosque in, in South Africa, 1822 to 1843. And I, I suspect there were many reasons why slaves embraced Islam. Why would I accept the religion of the oppressor? Why would I accept the religion of the person who deals out such brutal forms of punishment to the slaves here at the gate? And I think these are some of the factors. And we also find that, look, the Cape was famous for its wine, the flying wine, right? And I, I found a, 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 a picture in, in, in Niagara Waters book, The Making of the City of Cape Town, where there's a wagon loaded with a huge barrel of a vet, a wooden one, uh, uh, filled with wine. And you know, the driver of that, that wagon was a Muslim because the farmers trusted the Muslims. They were teetotalists. They didn't drink wine. And even in the wine industry in Paul, they were the people who made the vets for the wine because the, the farmers trusted them. And I think these are some of the factors that also, the, the, the farmer wasn't, wasn't very pleased to have his slave baptized because once a slave is baptized, then he cannot be sold. So it would be a financial loss to the farmer. So they preferred the slaves to, to, to remain Muslim. And I saw this also a contributive factor why so many slaves embraced Islam. So much so that by 1842, which is four years, after emancipation, one third of Cape Town was Muslim. The question that, that, that I want to ask is, is, if they were so successful, were the missionaries then not successful? Yes, they were. They were very much successful. And Sarti saw all this. In fact, after 1804, between 1804 and 1834, she saw the coming and the erection of churches in Cape Town around her. She saw the Anglican church. She saw the Catholic church. 
And uh, finally, in 1834, she saw the, the, the one in St. George's Street, the, 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 the St. George's Cathedral. All these buildings were dotting the landscape here in Cape Town. And it is here, and I think we, we have to go back to, to, to try to, to find out why is it that she becomes so important? Because when she drafted the will in 1841, she indicated that the one plot in Dorf Street should be used as a Mohammedan sakir. She made this wakaf. In other words, it was a charity that she made to the community. For as long as Islam is alive at the Cape, that place should be used as a mosque. And this is where Sarki wrote her name into the history of Cape Islam by being the first person to create such a wakaf in uh, uh, Islamic uh, system, of course, uh, uh, where you give a property for the, for the benefit of the community. And, and that, through that, she wrote her name into, into the Cape Annals of Islamic history. Sarki's character, she was a very strong personality because she made three of her sons the executors of her, of her estate. But sadly, three of her sons were involved in the establishment of a second mosque, not even a hundred meters away from the Oval Mosque in Beitengara Street. And because she was so upset, she totally excluded them from a testament. And she appointed, even when she died, she appointed Imam Bari to be the executor of her estate and also to see to it that she, she's buried. Now, this must have been very hard for her as a mother to virtually disown your own children, but it shows the strong character because she felt that they were doing Islam a disfavor by creating another mosque just not so far away from the old one mosque. Instead of building up the unity of the community, they were now breaking away and building another. And because of that, she totally excluded the children and didn't allow them even to conduct a burial when she died. And that tells you a lot about the strength of the character of this woman. This basically is the reason why it is so important that we should focus on this because she's the first woman who created this wakaf in the whole of South Africa when she drafted the will in 1841. During the British colonial period, especially after the formation of the South African Mission Society, I found evidence in the records of the Methodists specifically that they had no answer to counter the drive of the Imams during the British colonial period up to the emancipation of slaves. In fact, Van de Kem died in 1811. And when he died, the London Mission Society sent John Campbell to the Cape to make an assessment of how successful their mission work was in the colony. And when John Campbell arrives in Cape Town, he wrote this in his book, Travels in South Africa. Here in Cape Town, about 23 blacks that Muslims, they hire a room and to this room, they invite the slaves. And when the slaves leave that room, they are anti-white, they are anti-Christian and they've embraced Islam. So here I found conclusive proof out of the records of the Methodist church that the Imams were doing mission work right under the nose of the missionaries. And there's another, there's another one where, where they say that we've tried so much, but with very, very, very little success. In fact, in 1870, uh, I think the Reverend forgot his name now, but he also made the remark that these people are only embracing Islam to wear the nice red kerchief and for the nice cakes and tea, and they have a very loose way of life. It was not a very charitable way of describing Islam, but they had no answer. The sad part is that this dawah work, this mission work of the Imam did not continue 
in the latter half of the 19th century. Because by then there were so many mosques in the, in, in the book camp by to, during the last quarter of the 19th century. Breakaways, you know, because fighting amongst each other, who should be the Imam. In fact, Ahmad Davis has recorded this beautifully in his book, where he says, states that more than 20 cases landed up in the High Court, where the High Court had to decide who should be the Imam of the mosque. So mm -hmm. this infighting then continued and it, it virtually goes against the grain of the teaching of Islam, what was happening in the latter half of the 19th century. This is the world into which Sarchi was born and into which he died eventually. Sarchi van de Kaap. If there's any questions, Alta, I'll be too pleased to answer them. Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Ibrahim. I think that was a very powerful presentation. Um, Sarki is indeed a, a, a very strong person. Huh? Um, I can imagine she, she had uh, made a big contribution to the community. Okay, I would like to ask a question. It's um, Alta Jamieson from Pretoria, quite a chilly Pretoria. Um, I just want to say, Mr. Roda, thank you very much for this um, presentation. I think uh, we are aware of that particular, uh, how can I say, a bit of history, but I think you've opened a lot to us and um, I really enjoyed it. It was very insightful. And um, I would like to read a bit more, particularly on the treatment of the slaves during the both um, um, Dutch and uh, British times and so on. Which book would you recommend that would be really um, focused on that? Just the treatment of the slaves in general and what they were allowed to do and what not and you know, punishment and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think one of the books that I would surely recommend is it by Dr. Hans Hesse, Rech and Onrech. I think they translated that into English too. And of course, there are many other sources, but that is the, 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 the one that I can quickly think of is Rech and Onrech by Dr. Hans Hesse. And I may just, just mention that when they brought out the, I, I will list some of the forms of punish, punishment uh, before I go to the audience 19 of 1826. You know, you could be flogged, right, with the with sambok. And that sambok normally had some lead pieces in between. A part of your ear could be cut off, right? I know of one case where this, this slave, he forgot to stand up and take his hat off for his owner. And he was brutally punished just for that offense. And then, of course, they, they could put you on the rack and pull out the, your, your arms out of your sockets. Uh, then they would brand you with, with, a, with a hot iron. They would burn you a, a mark on your face or on your body. And in, in some case, I remember in 1780, there was a young guy from Java, Broku from Java. He was also a, a, a convict. He was first on Robben Island. And then he appealed to the authorities at the Cape to, to, to let him return to his motherland in Indonesia, but they refused. Eventually, they allowed him to come to the mainland and he worked in the slave lots. And again, he appealed to the authorities to let him go back to Indonesia, today known as Indonesia. They still refused. You know, he took out his krish, that is the dagger, and he ran amok. And that is where the Afrikaans were amok comes from. And he, I think he injured about 10 people. Eventually, they caught this guy. They took out his heart, right? And they beat him with his own heart. They cut up his body in four parts and they put it on stakes around the parade in Cape Town. They're right here in Cape Town. And then there's another incident of punishment. One of the greatest forms of resistance was desertion. They, they ran away, right? The other one was arson. And in, in 1736, I think uh, Cape Town and San Jose received the worst fires like the land the fire of London in the 10th century. So it was so easy to burn down the houses because all the houses were thatched roofs. And it's so easy to light that thatched roof. And that is why you find in the, in the book of most of the houses are now flat roofs because of the, 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 the danger of the thatched roof fires, right? And those 
men, they believed they were slaves who eventually ran away and they found a hiding place in, in the cave at Antler. I think there's a Dr. Robert Ross wrote about the Maroons of Antler. And that is one form of resistance. And there's one incident in Cape Town where this, this slave was caught trying to light the, 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 the face of the, his owner's house. You know what they did with him? They tied him to a pole and they burned him alive in, in, in public. So that was the forms of punishment. Now, when they brought out Ordinance 90 in 1856 under British rule, they indicated, number one, the slave owner must provide daily food for the slave. Secondly, he must provide for him with clothes, decent clothes annually. And working hours were stipulated. This to bring some sort of amelioration of the life of the slave in the cave. They were not supposed to work on Sundays and no children under 10 could be sold separately from the, the parents. Slaves could testify under oath against their masters in the court, right? Punishment for male slaves were then restricted to 25 letters. Mildly whooping for, me, for female slaves only across their soldiers. And then they had to be instructed the Christian faith in order that they may be able to marry in the church. As I pointed out earlier, slaves were not allowed to marry in the church. It was only then, after Ordinance 19 in 1826, the slaves were now permitted to marry in the church. I found another incident where Barnabas Shaw gave you a description. He came very late, he came 1816, and he, he says that they tried to preach in public, but the governor at the time, Lord Charles Summers, had refused them, especially in Cape Town where they were ordained ministers and established churches. They were not allowed to preach in public. But in one of the reports that I found at the University, Barnabas Shaw was saying this in 1817, that while we are allowed, would not allow to preach in public, the Mohammedan priests are moving into the interior and turn the slaves over to Islam. Because many of these slaves, they moved out of Cape Town because of poverty. I would call that a hijra. Hijra means a flight. A hijra from poverty to greener pastures. And many of the farmers allowed these slaves to squat on their farms because of the expertise that they could provide. They were uh, bricklayers, they were harness makers, they, they were carpenters, they were tailors, and any farmer would be too glad to have a person like that on his farm to assist with the construction of his stables and the mending of the harness of the oxen and the horses. But they were also targeted by the missionaries. And that is why Imam Ahmad of Bengalan sent out the Imam to this area in 1815. His name was Imam Abdul Samad, came from the town of Simarang. I've been fortunate to, to be to Simarang, the tribe we can trace some descendants of this Imam. And he, 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 he counted the missionaries in the Ottomans Holland Basin because by 1834, Bandar Bashar had bought up a huge tract of land in Somerset West. And by the 1847, there were three mission stations in the Ottoman Holland Basin, Salorish Pass, Redby, and Somerset West. But they also tried to convert the Muslims at the Strand, was then known as Mossad Bay. But I think the Islamic leadership was too strong. And in my records that I found in, in the, the, the uh, baptismal records of the Methodist Church in Somerset West, that they were not very successful because of the strong le Islamic leadership at Mossad Bay. Yes? Okay, I have a question. It is important to note that there are two Saras at the time, isn't it? There was a Sarki Bartman and the Sara Fandika. Now they are not the same person. It no. does it. Yes, you need no. to just maybe make that clear to everybody. Yes, I think that's very important. Thank you very much for that question. Sarki Bartman was taken to Europe as, as a sort of a piece to, 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 to have an exhibition because of the physique of this particular woman with huge buttocks. She was virtually uh, uh, displayed nakedly in Paris and in Europe. Eventually, I think they brought the remains back to, to the Cape. There were people who, who, who made an effort to bring the remains back to the Cape. So that is a totally different Sarti, Sarti Bartman. Sarti van der Kaap was a young girl born in uh, 1770 as a slave. And she, she mm -hmm. performed this this beautiful act of waka, the first act of waka in the whole of South Africa. 
could I ask some questions? You're would welcome. You please, yeah. Would you please repeat your references? With the, I didn't get them all down. Yeah, it's Children of Bondage by Professor Robert Sell. But you spell his surname? Sell is S H E L Sell, -L. and then there's Echoes of Slavery, that mm -hmm. is by Jackie Luce. By the way, for those people who know Jackie Luce, he used to be a columnist for the Argus, writing up specifically articles about slavery here at the Cape. She just left last week to settle in Ireland with her daughter. I've had the privilege of being a close friend of Jackie Lewis. And then, of course, there is a Descendant on the Muhammadana and Kapsat from Kievan. That was by J.C.L. Hasbrook. His thesis was written at Stanford University. And then, of course, there is uh, The Making of a City by the article you described. Um, oh, the article that is the uh, in the Burhanu. Uh, uh, let me just get it straight here. Thank you. It's uh, Burhanu. Burhanu Islam Movement. It was published on the 10th of July 2020. I'm sorry, who was that order or author? Uh, it, that is the name of the organization in the book of Burhanu Islam Movement. As B -O, o R H A N O L Burhanu Islam Movement. And I live here in the UK, and a lot of these books that you've mentioned are not available here. Are there any websites that you can suggest? I think maybe if you just Google, you know. I normally go to Professor Google when I get stuck. <laughs> and uh, I've been doing that. Up. I, I'm sure you might be able to find some of them. Some of them will be will be in the National Library of South Africa, but that you can't learn books there. You just got to go there for reference. But I'm sure that if you Google, you will find some places that you still have some of these books. Even the the Burhanu uh, movement in Cape Town, I think they still have stuff of of. Uh, the book, most of the book up by the late Dr. Ahmad Davids. Who wanted to know what, where can she get books? If she's in South Africa, there is a book, Breaking the Chains, Slavery and its Legacy in the 19th century of the Cape Colony. It, I it, think that uh, I took the bank, if I recall correctly, Lamy. Let me just get me back on so you can see me. Ah, wait, let me just... Can you hear me, Lamy? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. Now, now, Lamy, let me just see the picture. Oh, yeah. And yeah, that, that my... one... Is that the one by Dr. Banks? No, no, it's Nigel Warden and Clifton Grace. Oh, yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, Nigel Warden. Nigel Warden, by the way, was my external examinator, examiner for my thesis. Professor Nigel Wood, he's now retired. The other thing that I want to know, that I'd just like to uh, remark on, is, you know, we have such a beautiful language. And a lot of my messages now that I send to people, I send it as much and close as possible with the spelling of that language that was developed by the slaves. It was very interesting because they developed the slave language so that the owner could not understand. So they mixed it with Java, Javanese, they mixed it with Indian languages, and they mixed it with uh, Dutch and with French. So the French slave owner could not understand them when they spoke amongst each other. And there is so many books that was written by that one. Tuan Guru wrote a book on, if, I, if I'm correctly, in Arabic. And it had a lot of those type of languages in there. Now we've, somewhere along the line, we've gone to become very anglicized with our language. And we don't seem to, Especially the Muslims of the Cape and the Muslims that 
in the Western Cape actually, and it includes P as well, and is London. They don't speak those in that language anymore. And my biggest fear is when my generation passes on, that we won't have that language anymore because our children are all speaking Afri uh, English. Or if they speak Afrikaans, it's a very uh, Ferbudian Afrikaans or Diet Malan Afrikaans or the Afrikaans of the other people, but not the Dutch that some of these uh, Afrikaners they, uh, that they wrote in their books. So that's what I just want to know, Doctor, is it any way that that language can be put down in spelling with the phonon phonics on it? Yes, I, I can come on to that. There's a guy who sent me an email and where he mentioned some of these words that were used by the Muslims to their epithet, you know, words like number and things like that. And uh, I think the, the issue that we mark with the time, you see, even Afrikaans is, is very, very prominent here in the Western Cape, and especially in the rural area. Afrikaans will never die out. Afrikaans is, is the language of the Platanan, but there is a tendency in the towns where parents prefer their children to be in the English class. Even in my town in the Strand, we never had an English class, we're all that in Afrikaans, but now lately, is dual, you, you have a choice. And many of the parents, they prefer to, to, to go for English. And I think there must be a good reason for that too, because when you come to university, most of the books are in English. Even at Stalinbots University, most of the books, the technical books, they are in English and they published overseas. So I think my parents, they were fortunate. They, they, they were taught in, in Malayu. But when that Imam died in, in 1931, the language also died. They never spoke the language, but they were taught the basics of Islam in, in the Malayu. They could they could recite rote fashion wise, period fashion wise. They couldn't speak the language. And I think with time, we move with time, and it would be nice to retain some of these things. There are some people who believe that we should study the Malay language, rather study the Arabic language so that you can understand your your your, your Quran. But with time, I think we must, and language is all developed also with time. That is a natural phenomenon that happens worldwide. In, in 1688, they brought the Huguenots, settled them there in the France Hook area. That is why there's a monument there commemorating the coming of the Huguenots. Because of the difficulty that they had in Europe, they, they, they fled. Many of them went to America. Some of them came to the Cape 1688. But in the first hundred years, those French people who came, they were totally absorbed into the colonial community. The only thing that remains of them today at the Cape are the names of the farms and the surnames. But whereas in the case of the Muslims, there is a tendency in the world, like especially in France under Macron, Macron where they want Muslims to assimilate and let go of their Muslim identity. And this is where the resistance comes in. But here at the Cape, for more than 300 years, <coughs> we've never been assimilated. We've intermarried, fair enough. We've intermarried right across the, the, the racial spectrum, but we've never been absorbed. We have retained our Islamic identity. And I think that is one of the wonders of the Muslims here at the Southern Cape of Africa. We have found Muslims, Arab Muslims, to go to the West, to America. And we found some of the Tablis Jama, people who do mission work, where they came in South America. The children still had Muslim names, but they've lost everything about Islam. And that is why they're trying to revive these things. But the beauty of Cape Muslims, they've retained that identity. You and I today are the beneficiaries of the yeoman service that those people delivered for Islam. There's a question here from Lynn. She wants to know where she can get your books from, please. Yeah. At the moment, I've put some books with Timbuktu books here in Saibran Park. It's a little bookshop. The one is called, I think I've got the, 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 the I'll just show you the book. This is the book. Uh, 
It's called uh, Islamic Dawah during the Dutch in British colonial period. This is the little booklet. And uh, he's selling it. I have about 10 copies of my, my residence, but there's about 30 of them at Timbuktu Books. And then I've written a little book. Uh, it's actually a synopsis of my thesis, The Founding of the Stand Muslim Community, 1822 to 1928. That is the second one. And the third one, I only have three copies left. That is the story of the Wenzels, the, the a pioneering family of the Muslim family, whose, whose forefather was a German. And then, of course, I wrote a book in 2011, from slavery to citizenship. There's about, I think there's about six of them at number two books. And uh, in that book, I depict where we stayed in the strand before the group areas had moved out, just like district six. So, and then there's the big one where I converted my thesis into a readable book. I'll show you the one. This is about 260 pages. It, 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 it covers the period 1822 to 1966. It includes about a hundred families that I interviewed about their origin. And uh, of course, all the imams that serve the community and it's a special chapter on the missionaries. Of these, I only got three copies left, but if there is a demand, I can have it reprinted. And then of course, there's a little one, 1969. My brother was teaching in Zambia Muhammad Toiri passed on in 2016 at the age of 82. He was also a teacher at Trafalgar High School. He taught history. And he was teaching in Zambia and I went to see him. But when I crossed the bridge at Victoria, uh, Victoria Falls, I went to inquire about my visa for which I applied four months in advance. And you know what happened to me? They deported me. They declared me a prohibited immigrant <laughs> and I had to run back across the bridge. So while waiting for the visa to be posted from the strand to Bunawayo, I started to hitchhike. And for two and a half months, I hitchhiked the whole of Rhodesia, right across to Mozambique, up to Tete, across the Zambezi River, right up to the lakes in Malawi. And that's about roughly 50 pages. And there's some 10 copies of that little book that also had some back to books. And that book I wrote after 50 years, I wrote that from memory with some little pictures of the places that I've been to. How did you find the slave people in, in, to trace them? How do you manage to do that? Yeah, no, okay. That's very interesting, <laughs> Alka. <laughs> you know, I had one aunt. Her name was Rahima Krombi. She's my father's sister. She died at the age of 90. And uh, Lamy, who you listened to earlier, He's married to the grandchild of that, that lady, Rahima Krombi. Her name is Dosa, that's the grandchild. So I interviewed her and I said, look, she couldn't read and write, but she had an encyclopedic memory. And then she told me about all the Muslim families of the strand, not only our own family, you know, the Railuns, the Fanis, the Badaruns, the Wenzel, the Daniels, you name it, the Wanzas. And when I went to the archives, I found all those names. 99% of them I found in the archives. Because if you lived, you must have died. And unfortunately, our records start from about 1895, when, when people have, were compelled by law to register any death or birth or whatever. But the lady who put us on, on, on the road to the slaves was also a roader. Her name was Khadija Roder. She was the, the granddaughter, she was the daughter or the granddaughter of Fakhadin Rode, who was a slave, also on the farm of the Mokos. His name was Leander, and his brother was Jacobus. So she knew that, that their forebears were slaves, she knew the slave names. So when I started to research, when we were busy with the Cape Heritage Slave Project under UCT and UWC, with Nigel Warden and Dr. Banks and Susie Newton King. They, they, they showed, introduced us to the slave records. And then I, because I knew their names, the, the slave names, and I knew their Muslim names, and I knew when they died. So it was quite easy for me to trace them. And I can remember this one lady, a very English lady who came to one of our workshops in the archives. 
Mrs. Mr. Rhoda, we know that our great great grandmother was a slave woman. So I asked her, Do you know her name? She says, Yes, we know her name. You know on which farm? She said, Yes, we know on which farm. And you know, and within that four hours that they spent in the workshop, they found her. So once you have certain oral history, you know what names, and you have dates, it helps a lot to be able to trace. And I've been able to trace the in case of my own family that my grandchildren are now the eighth generation of the Rhodes. And the matriarch is a slave one who was born in 1791 on the farm of the Mokuls. She, she was also a, 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 a maid in the house. And I suspect she also slept on the floor in the kitchen of the farmhouse. That's where the women slept. And in, in the morning, they would roll up their bedding and put it in the box. And the authorities had the right and even the owner to search the, the box for any stolen goods. That is why Imam Ahmad of Bengalan complained to the Vicks Commission in the 1820s about this practice of the authorities that they can search without the warrant, they can search the house and the property of any slave or any free black. That happened here in Cape Town. And I mean, such laws were also introduced in the apartheid area where they could arrest you without trial and lock you up and search your house without a warrant. And these things were in place even during the slave period in the Cape. It was only put into statute under the apartheid rule. <laughs> Ik wil graag weet, ik heb twee groot groot oma's. Al twee was Eva's, Eva van die Kaap. Die een is met de smit getrouwd, en een was met de mol getrouwd. Ja. Daar kan ik bykie meer van hulle kry. Ek, ek, ek het nou hulle datums, ek, die Eva wat met die smit getrouwd is, hulle het, was formeel getrouwd, hulle het ja. twee kaart gehad wat formeel gedoop is. So ek het een bykie inlichting, ek het gehoop ek kan dalk met die e-post vir die van die inlichting stuur. Ons het heel wat mense gehelp met die werkswinkels van about 4,5 ure waar ons mense opgeleid het hoe om hierdie documenten uh, uit te kry uit die archief. Vooral as jy soek nou familielede en so aan. Want daar, daar is, daar is doodregisters, re? en die, in, in die geval van die doodregisters gaan het so ver terug as die van Jan van die Lutse tyk. Bij baie documente wat daar bewaar is, in die geval van ons mense, die soegenaamde kleerlinge, begin het maar hier van 1895, maar, maar, en dit is groot maar, as jy het testament gehad, dan gaan jy die testament kry daar in die archie, al was het toen in die 1700 boek, jy gaan het kry daar, want dit is allemaal bewaar daar, so, so dit is die een plek, dit is die een plek, ek, ek, ek het van alle testamente gekry, en ek het ook hulle hevelik gekry, Maar ek het gedog een bykie meer achtergrond, die, die, die was haar ouders, waar het sy geblei. Ja. Ek, ek, ek sal met die correspondeer op die e-post en dan kan ons... Ja, nie, wat ek vir jy nou kan sê, een plek wat het moendlik kan gevind word as jy het een doodskennisgevings kry, is best notis. Nou in baie gevalle, nie in alle gevalle nie, kry jy op een doodskennisgeving, kry jy wie is die pa, wie is die ma, hoe oud was hy, wat was sy werk, waar het hy gesterf, en wie was die kinders. Dit kreeg gewoonlik op een death notice of een Afrikaanse doodkennisgeving. Ek in die geval van my eie familie, het ek gekry dat hy allemaal die name waar hy tante genoem het op die doodkennisgeving. In my boek bewys ek, dat as gevolg van ondertrouwerie, because of intermarriage, the whole community became one big family. And because I can now mention, it starts with the Wenzels, right? And the Wenzels married into the Wanzas. And then some of them married into the Railuns, like Jamila married Khatib Railun, who came from Batavia. Then you find there's the Brunkese. Now Brunkese also clung, sounds very, very Dutch. Something Brunkese who was also a Wenzel. And then the Farnis came. And then the Badruns. The Badrun was a very big family of the strand, so Antikuri was a Badrun. She married the Tahamad Badrun. And because of this intermarriage, the, the strand Muslim community became one huge family. And that's the beauty of the strand. And that is why it's right what you say. Everybody knew everybody. Ek on those who par jaar gelede was amal, en ek praat van amal, uiters geskok oor die situasie by die, ek dink dit was die Gordons Bay begraafplaas. 
Ja. Is, daar, is daar een probleem ooit opgelost? Want is nou doe het stil mee hoor, nooit, nooit meer af van nie. Ja, kan, ik, uh, weet je, ik weet zeker af van. Ja, die begraafplaats is nog daar. Daar, daar is een ontwikkeling plaats van daar haven. Uh, wat is die naam nou? Maar is, 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 en het is zelfs een nieuwe haven daar gebouwd. Dat was een soort van een resort, you know. En, uh, maar die begraafplaats is toch altijd daar langs die hoofdweg. Dat was niet verwijderd niet. Want maar, je, maar, maar, wat is maar, maar, en dan zie je nog allemaal die kruisen daar. Maar, maar, maar sê daar kruisen iets van, ik verstaan dat daar een gebouw wat aan die zeekant opgericht is. Ja. Die is hoe op die grafte ge, gebouwd. Dat is een moeilijkheid. Ik draag niet bij je kennis daarvan, nee. maar dat is een moeilijkheid. Kijk, al die cellen gedoen hier bij Grootskier, nee. Als je, daar was de kroonbegrafplaats daar bij Observatory. En daar had een hele complex gebouw, daar tikken bij you name it. Een hele grote bezige complex, een gebouw op die begrafplaats. Daar in, in Observatory in Kaapstad. Mm, mm. En ik vermoed dat die, die, die vooral nou, ik hoor net voor ochtend of gisteren een opinie, dat daar is een tekort aan begrafplaatsen met die beide mensen, wat nu sterft aan het gevolg van die COVID-19. En, en Indië heeft ons opgelet dat als Indië niet moet, 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 moet brand niet, die de mensen verras niet, dan zullen die hele Indië nou in die tijd een begrafplaats te wezen. Zo so zullen nou daar sterven, zo so spreken 13 mensen daar van COVID-19. Mm -hmm. so, uh, misschien is die die, die ons verras moet zijn, die moet zien verras moet zijn, die wat wel gebeurt, en dan maakt ook grachten weer op. So, mijn pa, toen hij sterft in, in, in 1996, hij was 89. Toen maak ons zijn moeder zijn grap op wat gesterf het in 1917. En al wat ons gevind het was net een paar dingetjes bij je, je man. Ik zou taal al vergaan nou. Mm. Dus dat kan nog gebeuren bij je gevallen uh, wat begrafplaatsen be, uh, betreft. Ja, daar, daar grachten in, 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 uh, in, in Gordon's Bay, daar wit stinkjes, het niet ene naam op nie. Ons het gaan kijken, hij het niet namen op nie. En, en daar is daar bij Rondebosch. <coughs> Hulle het, ek denk dat het St. Peter's Church, hulle het daar so groot blok opgesteld, wat hulle noemde Osserie, en al die klomp bene, wat hulle opgegraven het, is daar begraven onder daar, so vloer daar so, en as daar name op die bord, en as daar net een paar stenen, so het hier nie meer rondom. Maar hy klomp, gedoen. ja maar hy klomp bene, wat hulle in een graf begraven het, het een probleem geskip. Maar toen zijn jullie skellere onder die benen en dan zoek waar is mijn arm, waar is mijn rug, waar is mijn... Was jy al ooit op een eiland bij die begrafplaatsen daar? Nou, ons was nou eindig daar geweest. Het was weer disappointing to go to the cemetery there at Robin Island, because why they, you're on a bus and they don't allow you to get off the stand. Ja, so, so you basically are on a bus and you're sitting on a tour and you're listening to all sorts of things while you actually want to get off and look at the graves. I just stopped and said, these are the graves. Yeah, no, the reason why I'm asking is that some of the Wenzels, Ismudin Wenzel and mm. his younger brother, Hamad Wenzel, mm. they both died in the hospital on the Hobbin Island. They okay. were, they suffered from leprosy because the leprosy hospital was mm. on the island, right? Mm. And uh, I was just curious to know if it is possible to find to go there and I possibly find the one died, the one died in 1893 and the other one died in 1900. But they don't allow you to go to, and, 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 and visit the graves, no? No, we were not allowed. We were just on the tour bus. Um, you don't even have opportunity to, to walk around and to look at things. I don't know if you need special permission, but we did not get that and there was not even anybody to ask. You yeah, just yeah. had to sit and go through the tour. Yeah. It was interesting, but it's not quite what I wanted to see. There was a law in place that if a, a, a cemetery lies dormant for more than 25 years, then the state has the right to expropriate it. So what happened? They, the municipality expropriated that, and they, under the leadership of Imam Noor Rahmatullah, they took out all the remains of those graves, and they reburied it in the new one in Gordon's Bay Road. But there was no compensation at that time. But I do believe that the Strand Muslim Council, they put in a claim for compensation as, because eventually the, the municipality sold the land to the post office people 
uh, and, and they put up the new post office on, on, on the burial site. That right in the main road we used to bury. Because I suspect, I found that many of the fishermen at Mustard Bay, they drowned. In fact, there was one, the earliest one is of a Japanese by the name of Ongu Taludin. I wrote a story about him too. He drowned in 1842, and I suspect he was buried in that, in that graveyard. And also in 1878, there were another two fishermen. The one was a Vahi, and the one was a Daniels, Kiyamudin Daniels. They were all buried in that. And by 1898, the provincial authorities closed that cemetery because it was full. And that is where uh, Khatib Railun came to the scene, and he applied for a new piece of, of, of burial ground. And he was granted that. And from 1899, they started burying in the new one in Golden Bay Road. And we still have the document to show that we are the private owners of that cemetery. There was a time in the 1920s when the municipality tried to get control of all the cemeteries. They succeeded to get hold of all the other denominations, you know, the Jewish cemetery, the Methodist, the Dutch Reform, but the Muslims refused to hand over under the leadership of the late Mr. Khan. They refused to hand over the cemetery to the municipality. So today we are still the owners, the legal owners. We've got the document of the cemetery that was purchased by Khatib Railun way back in the 1890s. I just want to thank Mr. Roda for all the history. Oh, alhamdulillah, wa shukrila. I'm not gonna say anymore, but it was wow, alhamdulillah. Yes, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. And at some point in time, I'm gonna bring you a personal gift of some of my books. Okay, Whenever, whenever the COVID-19 allows me to leave the house because we all <laughs> locked down, as you know. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Ibrahim. We really appreciate you putting the morning aside and getting your family and friends to join us and all the other people who signed up. We were a whole lot of people here. Thank you for that. It was really a wonderful talk, Mr. Ibrahim. You, you talk about these things all out of your head. You don't even have a look at piece of paper in front of you. It is amazing. I don't even know my own family like that. And you know the whole strand. <laughs> I, I know. I think I must have inherited this from my aunt, Auntie Rahima Frombi. She mm -hmm. had this, 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 I would say, encyclopedic memory. <laughs>